what the frick was that sound? It's almost like they- Oh, wait a minute, I know what they did. Okay, the sound cue you guys just heard, it's actually supposed to sound like this. I guess they're just trying to remove potentially offensive religious references, given that this is a game about shooting things. Which is precisely why they left the cross symbol on the checkpoints. Wait, what? Today's Ancient DOS game is Electro Man, also known as Electro Body. And with the bulk of my game design know-how, I can sum this game up in a very unique way which I don't think has ever been said. You know those story-based cinematic platformers out there like Another World and Prince of Persia, where you die very easily, those are given means to try sections over and over again until you succeed, ultimately seeing more of the story with each section you get through? Electro Man plays exactly like those kind of games but with no story elements. This puts Electro Man in an uncomfortable position. It's extremely repetitious and monotonous from having to do parts over and over and over again until you get them right. Which wouldn't be so bad if there was some story or intrigue to go along with it to keep the player wanting to learn more about what's going on, but there's none of that in this game. In fact, if you have the patience to get through it completely, the ending is just a single screen of text followed by the title screen. That said, what's here controls well and plays well, so it's not that it's a bad game, it's just, well, boring. <laughs> Electro Man was originally developed by Xland Games, a Polish group which later became known as Chaos Works, and while they had originally self-published this title as Electro Body, Epic Mega Games helped to publish it in North America in 1993 with a new name. However, this game may have been out as early as 1991, as the original Polish packaging has a copyright of 1991 on it. Though going by the file dates on the versions I have access to, it may not have actually come out until 1992. There was also a boxed release by Monkey Business, so I can't find any information on that one at all. It's technically a one-player run-and-gun platformer, although to be perfectly frank, it plays more like a cinematic platform, as previously mentioned but without any cinematic elements at all, so calling it one would be kind of a misnomer. The original release supports an interesting array of video modes, including support for both 320x200 4 color and 640x200 monochrome CGA graphics, although it looks its best by far in its VGA 320x200 256 color mode. It also supports the PC speaker, DACs like the Kovac speech thing, Adlib cards, and Sound Blaster cards, and is capable of producing digitized sound and music on all of those. Now, doing it on a PC speaker is hard enough, but extremely few people were able to pull it off on AdLib. Mind you, it sounds like garbage under DOSBox, but then DOSBox wasn't built to emulate DAC processes over AdLibs, so I imagine it would probably sound better on real hardware. Still, Sound Blaster is the best way to go for sure. As for its current release date, it was made freeware in June of 2006, can be obtained from a number of websites. Though this time around, we'll go with the usual standby the RGB Classic Games website at www.classicdosgames.com, which also has other registered and shareware versions available for download for anyone curious. The physical copies are virtually impossible to find now, to the point where I couldn't even gauge any reasonable prices, as the only copy I could find was for a shareware disc being sold for a ridiculous $45. And it's a shame, too, because the original physical release included something intriguing, which I'll actually talk about a little later. One other thing to quickly note is that the freeware release of the game completely omits support for older video modes, and only supports VGA graphics. Just something to keep in mind if you're curious about those older video modes. 
Once again, no reason to delve into the whole story section, because the story to this game is literally nothing more than you playing the role of someone named Jack, who has become cybernetically enhanced in order to take revenge against aliens for killing his family. Actually, elements of the story change depending on which version you're playing, but since none of these elements are given in the game itself until you beat it, and because none of the story elements given outside of the game in any of its iterations match up with the end screen text, uh, yeah, this game virtually has no story. The gameplay, though, is extremely straightforward. You move around with the arrow keys, you jump with the up arrow key, you activate teleporters with the down arrow key, and you can shoot with the space bar. And these are pretty much the same controls if you decide to use a joystick or gamepad, so using the DOSBox key mapper to remap the jump control to a second button can be extremely helpful. No, your gun in this game is somewhat interesting. When you first start out, it's completely empty of any power and can't be used. Thus, you have to acquire batteries to charge it up. Each battery increases the meter in the lower right corner, and as the meter gets higher, more useful types of shots can be fired. Though they start draining more and more energy, meaning each level of battery power gives you fewer shots than the last before the power drops down to a previous level. The meter at the bottom left is your heat gauge. And basically, the more you fire your gun and the more powerful your shots are, the more heat is built up. If heat levels are too high, the gun won't fire. This essentially keeps you from spamming shots like mad, though to be frank, having limited ammo does that job well enough, and the heat gauge ultimately ends up being almost completely pointless. The first level of power is a very simple laser pulse that has short range. The next level of power can cross the entire screen. The next level of power is a spinning fireball that can hit things more easily because of how big it is. The next level of power is a slow-moving energy ball that passes straight through everything that isn't solid, destroying everything in the process. The final level of power is a massive shockwave that can hit things on the floor, which is necessary to bypass a handful of spots later in the game. The trick, however, is that your gun energy is completely depleted any time you access a checkpoint. At the same time, though, everything in the level resets when you die, so accessing a checkpoint is often the best thing to do, unless you would prefer to respawn at the last checkpoint you accessed. To that end, sometimes checkpoints are intentionally put in inconvenient places, though this doesn't actually happen that often. Now, the goal in each level is to find three control cards to enable access to the level's exit teleporter. Now, unlike everything else in each level, the control cards are not reset if you die. Thankfully. So once you grab a particular card, you don't have to worry about it if you can reach a checkpoint again or not. This is also a game-saving feature, but it only records which cards you've grabbed and where your active checkpoint is. So even if you save right in the middle of a level, if you return to the game later, you're going back to your last checkpoint. However, the difficulty of this game is extreme. The first level isn't actually all that bad, but the second level ramps it up considerably, and each subsequent level just gets harder and harder. I ultimately gave up on level 6 as things started to get way too ridiculous, but there's only 8 levels anyways, so this game definitely went for difficulty over content to lengthen its playtime. Thankfully though, every level does look different, so at least you're getting some different imagery going on as you progress through. While there are enemies strewn about everywhere, you're actually more likely to die from the excessive number of traps laid around. Many of the traps have very short windows of opportunity for dealing with them, and are sometimes placed in highly insidious locations. This kind of adds a sort of puzzle-solving element in a way, but more times than not, it just makes the player frustrated as they now have to solve a puzzle that has no real challenge to it, and it just requires you to be patient or collect more batteries or both. Now, although extremely rare, it's actually possible to make a level unwinnable, either by intentionally missing a card that's placed right in your path that you can't get back to, or by managing to finagle yourself somewhere which you shouldn't normally be capable of getting into. A problem more prevalent with earlier versions of the game and tweaked in later versions. Still, pressing the R key allows you to trigger a level restart if you need it. Now, one thing I do have to say is that the animation is very smooth and fluid in this game, more so than most games of its time. Although, given that there's not many things to animate in the first place, I guess that balances things out a little. You may have also noticed by now that there's no music in game. Well, this is because physical copies of the game included the soundtrack on a cassette tape, so that even if you lacked a decent audio card, you could still have music playing back while playing the game. 
Of course, this approach meant that if you had the shareware version, lost the cassette, or are playing it nowadays as a strictly digital download, you wouldn't have any in-game music. And there's actually almost nothing more to say about this thing. I mean, I could elaborate on enemies and traps, though for the most part, they're all very basic and you'll learn pretty quickly how to deal with them. In fact, I only really have a few tips towards getting through this game. The first is to be selective about what you shoot and just avoid everything else. There's no score counter in this game, so if you don't need to shoot something to get past it, then don't shoot it. It's just going to respawn when you die anyways. Also, if you pick up a battery and are immediately faced with a checkpoint you want to use, just use the checkpoint, die, and go fetch that battery again. No sense pushing forwards without weapon energy when you could easily have some. Lastly, the teleporters are always linked vertically with teleporters that are either on the same screen or other screens directly above or below you. So it's actually not that hard to determine where they're going to take you when you use them. Actually, once you realize the teleporters work this way, it becomes much easier to get around the maze-like levels that this game has. Overall, Electro Man is well made, but extremely boring and repetitive. Now, if there was an in-depth story and plenty of story segments sprinkled in which meshed with the gameplay, this game would be about a million times better. As it stands, it's an okay game, but nothing special, and only really worth a try if you enjoy this sort of gameplay where the difficulty is extremely high and your success is based on learning what you need to do from a platforming standpoint to get through the various obstacles you face. Thankfully, it's incredibly easy to set up in DOSBox. Just set cycles to max and you're good to go. The game works fine with the auto setting too, but the loading times will be much longer. When even the internal joystick support works without any extra configuration. Anywho, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next week for episode 157, we're going to be taking a look at two games. An original and its sequel, both of which are fairly simple 2D shooters. However, one was originally freeware, and the other was originally shareware. There's a couple things which fit this description, so you're just going to have to trust your instincts when you send your guests to 80 pixelshipscom and stay tuned to see just what games these happen to be.